Honorable Chairperson, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, my name is Vanessa Tahaya. I am the niece of Siam Tahaya, a journalist and photographer who has been imprisoned without a trial in Eritrea since 2001. When following the world's reactions to the peace deal this summer, I started to think about what it takes for hope to die. My uncle was imprisoned because he lost hope. He was one of the brave members who fought for the country's independence and after the war was won in 1991, rightfully expected democracy. In 2001, he, alongside other journalists members of the, and members of the Eritrean regime who also had publicly demanded change, were imprisoned without a trial. In the beginning, he had hope. It was a new state, a new government. It was his comrades from the struggle. But that could only keep him hopeful for a short time. Because of the government's policies, behavior, and lack of democratic progress and commitment, he started to publicly push for change. Like I said, he was imprisoned in 2001 without a trial. The last time I interacted with Eritrean regime officials in this manner was at the African Commission on Human and People's Rights in Banjul, Gambia. The reply I got when I asked when the suffering was going to end was that the second the situation with Ethiopia was going, to, was going to be resolved, once the border was demarcated, my uncle was going to be released and everything was going to change. That has been the government's official line since 2001 to justify everything that has happened since then. I'm not downplaying what governments have to deal with when facing threats to national security. It happens all the time. But you have to deal with it in a legal and proportionate manner. The Eritrean regime's response has neither been legal nor proportionate. The government has refused to implement the constitution. There hasn't been a legal declaration of emergency where their actions receive neither ex ante or ex post authorization. On top of that, the actions they were arguing was a reaction to the no peace, no war situation was grossly disproportionate. The standoff of the border cannot justify the fact that all capable Eritreans are listed into the national service indefinitely. It cannot justify the fact that the country's just, uh, constitution still has not been implemented and that the parliament still has not convened since 2002. It does not justify the fact that the only university in the country has been shut down, that the free press still has not been opened, and that tens of thousands of people have been imprisoned without a trial, simply for expressing their opinions, practicing their religion, or attempting to leave their country. It does not justify the fact that my uncle and his colleagues, who were imprisoned all the way back in 2001, have not received a day in trial, and that their family members are still waiting to hear anything about their loved ones. It is hard to understand how anyone could take their justification about the no war, no peace situation for their human rights atrocities seriously. And yet, peace made many hopeful. Governments, governmental institutions, and individuals, mostly diaspora-based Eritreans, congratulated the Eritrean regime and said that this would be the beginning of something new. This Saturday marked exactly eight months since the peace deal. And the only changes that we have seen are business-related or diplomatic. The Constitution has still not been implemented, national service is still indefinite, prisoners remain imprisoned, dissidence is still strictly forbidden. Interestingly enough, eight months after the peace deal, the border has still not been demarcated, despite being the main justification that the government had used. On top of that, there has been no transparency around the details of the peace agreement. Isaias Forki has not addressed the uh, people about the actual content, and he did not address the people directly until a TV interview in October, three months later. There has been no promises of democratic change, and still I read and hear about hope for this regime. So I am wondering, what does it take for hope to die? When the human cost of the Eritrean regime rule has been so high, and they have shown no signs of improvement, what makes so many people and governments around the world remain hopeful? What we have been seeing from the European Union, from their individual member states, from the United States, from Ethiopia, Somalia, Kenya, and many other countries, is not hope. It cannot be. Because hope cannot exist in a vacuum. Hope needs the very least evidence of intent to exist and evidence of progress to persist. Hope has an expiration date, and in the Eritrean regime's case, it is long overdue. What we are seeing is simply the language of hope being used to camouflage self-interest at the expense of the well-being of the Eritrean people. My favorite law professor taught me to always apply the hurt test when analyzing social, legal, or political situations. If I do this, then who will be hurt? I urge you to do the same. 
I know this is not hope. So whatever it is that you have, whether it's personal, commercial, or geopolitical interest, I urge you to apply the hurt test. I urge you to think about my cousins who have been, haven't seen their father in 18 years. I urge you to think about the people who remain in prison. I urge you to think about every single person in the national service who are victims of sexual abuse and whose perpetrators are never taken to trial. I urge you to think about the Eritrean people and the impact your support has on the prolonging of their suffering. Thank you. Thank you.